It's so lovely to be here in Bantry for this interview. It's a festival that we both love to attend as audience and participants. And thank you so much to Emer O'Hurley and Sarah O'Donovan and everyone at West Cork Literary Festival for making us so welcome again. And if they'll have us, we'll be back next year for a live event with the full participating audience. It is my very great pleasure today to introduce you to Kate O'Reardon. Uh, award-winning short story writer, novelist, playwright, screenplay writer, and all-round crack merchant from everything I've heard about you. Everyone will know Kate's work from Mr. Selfridge to uh, the recently widely acclaimed TV drama Smother, which had the nation grippy gripped in six weeks of the grimmest part of the lockdown. Um, so Kate, first of all, you are no stranger to Bantry. Do you want to tell us about oh, how you know Bantry? I know Bantry because I'm from here. So that's an easy one. And I know Bantry House very well um, and the festival. And I've done many things for the festival in the past, not in the last few years. And what was it like to grow up in a town like this? Um, like it's, it's become very modern since I grew up. Yeah. Um, in my day, it was just a very small provincial town. Um, you know, there was sort of, it sounds awful, but there were dogs on the street, you know, it was just normal, <laughs> like you, you find in a, a little village in Portugal today. Um, and everybody, well, I suppose they still do, everybody knows everybody mm -hmm. again, but really everybody did know everybody. And there wasn't really uh, a proper huge big supermarket. I mean, when I was a girl, that was sort of yeah. being built. So you went to one shop for your butter you went and you got your milk in another shop and you went with the gallon and uh, it, it was taken straight out of the crate. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know, those are all my And your dad memories. was a butcher. And my dad was a butcher. That's, that's Louise O'Neill's dad was a butcher and she's from down the road in Clonakilty. What is it with butchers' daughters? I, I don't know. <laughs> it's that cleaver or something. I, I'm not quite sure. But there were three butchers in town and they were all called McCarthy and they were all rivals. So we were the Bonnies. Um, and yeah. Somebody else was a butcher as well, some other writer. Some, His yes. father was. Yes. Uh, there's some I can't think who yeah. it is, but there's somebody else. Yeah. It's um, did you come from a big family? Small family? Uh, relatively small at the time. Yeah. Because I mean nine and fourteen was quite normal. So there was just four of us. Yeah. So there's me, I'm the eldest, and then my sister and two brothers. Okay. And um, you then went off to far-flung places like Clonakilty and Skibbereen <laughs> for work. <laughs> what kind of work, what kind of jobs did you do well, there? It was, well, it was all for the same company. Um, I worked for West Cork Travel. Okay. Um, uh, I, I left... Uh, you did a good job. Did I? Yeah, because <laughs> I came down here every year of my, for, of, of my summers when I was a child. Every year to, to West Cork. So you did, yeah. you did a great job. We're well, at the here. time, there, there was um, the there was the tankers would come into Widdy, so right. it was hugely busy. West Cork Travel Bantry, and I had no notion. I left school. Um, I didn't go to college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Granny was sick in the shop, so I automatically kind of got stuck in the shop. Yeah. And then uh, there was a man called George Plant in West Cork Travel, a uh, very very lovely man, and. Uh, he knocked on the, the house door one night and he and dad huddled inside in the living room. And the next thing I knew, they came out and I was sold. And then <laughs> it's <laughs> like an arranged marriage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was told you're working for West Cork Travel now. So I started in Bantry and then there was a branch in Skibbereen and there was a branch in Clonakilty. And so I put my time in in all of those. And then I went to L.A. for a year uh, to another travel agency. I read agency. that. You yeah. spent time in L.A. Yeah. and Canada yeah. and where else? Australia. Yeah. And what did you do in those places? Uh, like the, mostly the travel business. Okay. When I was in Canada, I was just doing filing for my uncle. I had three uncles who lived there. Um, and in Los Angeles, it was a travel agency. And was that selling yeah. Ireland to... Them. Selling Ireland to them. Okay. But it was and it was an Irish travel agency. Okay. But he had got the niche market for all the priests and monsignors. <laughs> so oh uh, yeah, that was a huge market. So they would organise all these tours to Our Lady of Guadeloupe and Guadalajara and all of that. And so Fantastic. you'd get oh yeah, it was it was big, big business. So you'd get all the bishop 
and the priests and the minions all the way down the line. And then you get all the groupies who followed them everywhere. Um, and, you know, you'd get phone calls saying, uh, can you make sure that I'm, you know, next door to Bishop, whatever. And tell me, did any of the, those jobs influence the work that you later did as a writer? I'd like to say yes, Liz, but honestly, it didn't. No. No. no, no. no. I really can't imagine in any which way that it did. And what about uh, TV shows or books that you read as a teenager? Was uh, there anything of those that influenced you later on? Yeah, I mean, I think I was influenced by whoever I was reading at the time, because I did read voraciously. Yeah. And, I, and I watched TV voraciously as well, which I still do. Um, and if I was reading the Russians, I would be totally into that kind of style. And then I would read... You see, they're big yeah. families, you know, the yeah. Russians, yeah, big yeah. families. Yeah. Smother. Yeah. Smother could easily be Russian. Yeah. And, <laughs> and landscape, you know, their obsession with the landscape, yes. which I think we very and much massive have. Massive extended Irish. families. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, people, they think that uh, War and Peace, oh my goodness, that's like a really difficult book. It's not. It's like a soap. It yeah. really is. Once you read the characters, it trips along. It's a fantastic story, intercutting stories. It, it, you just can't believe that, you know, one man kept it all in his head. So then I'd read that. Then I'd read Virginia Woolf, the complete opposite. And then I'd get very Virginia Woolfy in short stories for a while. Um, uh, and then the Deep South... America loved all of that yeah and of course running with that all the Irish writers McGahan and anybody else fantastic so, yeah and so what was the turning point for you when did you begin to write or when when did the writing muscle kick in I think and where were you when that happened I think I was in bed with yellow jaundice no I mean what country oh I <laughs> In Ireland, in Bantry, okay. Okay. in Bantry, in when bed you were for back three home. months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I had absolutely nothing to do. And I'd read every book that I had, and I had done all my um, drawings and stuff like that. So I started writing uh, fairy stories. So I thought I'd make a collection of fairy stories. I was really into Sinead de Valera. She had these oh, yes, fabulous, I those. yeah, yeah Gorgeous. fabulous collections, and they were dark, like they were more like the Grimm brothers. They were like the old Pichogues. Um, loved all of that. So I was kind of trying to write uh, a collection of fairy stories. That was Fantastic. it, really. Fantastic. And then your first novel involved won the Hennessy Prize yep. in 1995. Did you feel then, I've arrived? <laughs> like, I don't have to do another thing. This is me. I'm set up for life. Uh, I didn't really, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, that book was written in the two hour breaks that I got because my son was born at the same time and he was regular as clockwork unlike my daughter with his two hours snooze every day and then the weekends um, and yeah I mean it, it the joy of being published the first thing I did was I got an agent which was yeah. a miracle getting an agent is the hardest thing yes I don't think people realize that no they don't it's it it's incredibly tough. yeah yeah it's 70 percent 80 percent of the battle really yeah um, because otherwise you're just sending, and unfortunately, what they call in publishing terms, the slush it goes pile. the slush pile. Yeah, the and that is slush pile. It's disgusting, the slush pile. But that's where you will go mm. if you don't have an entrance, if you mm. don't have an agent. An agent. Um, and I just was lucky enough to be at some function in London, met an agent, and asked her to represent me. But so I had to send in all sorts of different pieces of work and the whole works and everything. And then even at that, I still had to write blind. You know, yeah. that first book, you just have to do it by yourself. I think I was so naive when I was first yeah. published. I mean, I thought, I thought, I was thinking, sure, Harper Lee wrote one book and then went into hiding. I said, that's exactly, that would suit I me know. perfectly. You I know. know. And I remember looking at the Irish Times bestsellers list and it might say 200, you know, yeah. 247. But I thought that was 247,000. I know. <laughs> and I really I, had no I know, idea I know. of like yeah. the minuscule number of book sales that Absolutely. it takes to get into yeah. the bestsellers list. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and all you ever hear about is like the, oh, you know, such and such got a, a six figure <laughs> yeah. yes, for yes. a two book deal and yes. everything. And actually, the reality of it is it's that much more. It's, yeah. I mean, for the amount of time, if you were to take it by hour, yeah. The hourly rate, 
the amount of time that you put into a book, you probably you'd be you lucky. You probably earn more in McDonald's. You yeah. probably earn more in McDonald's. <laughs> and that is something that, I mean, certainly people do have breakthroughs if it's, a, you know, if, if there's some, if there's some selling, if there's a gimmick, yeah, um, you know, if they were a celebrity before or whatever, they're yeah. attached. Or if there's some big hook like Gone Girl or Girl on the Train. Or exactly. Those, yeah. And the publisher gives it that push, you yeah. know, if it's if it's in the zeitgeist at the yeah. time as well. Look how many books now have the word girl in them yeah. and uh, with such ranging um, quality in them. You know, some of them are great, but just putting girl in for a while. Uh, like every publisher wanted that. It's so, true. yeah, it is. Uh, I think people would be very, very surprised. And you're now settled in London. Is that because there's so much more opportunity there? Well, the truth is, a long time ago, my husband and myself, he's from Bantry as well. Mm. We headed off to Canada right. to make our fortune. Right. Uh, to stay with my uncle there. Uh, we couldn't get work permits and we ended up back in London we didn't have enough for the last leg of the journey, <laughs> money-wise, to get back to Ireland. And anyway, there was nothing at that time. There was nothing here for us. So uh, that was it. We just went job hunting. We hired one of those, you know, by the week uh, apartment type things uh -huh. um, and just went out and joined agencies and got whatever job we could get, really. And do you get homesick for Bantry, for Ireland? I don't get a chance to, to be honest with You're you, Liz. So no, I, it's, that comes so often. Yeah. I mean, the last two years has, have been really quite painful from that regard. Yeah. Uh, it's the longest I haven't seen my mother, I'd say probably since I went to LA all those years ago. So usually, and because Donald's family's from here as well, yeah. uh, although his mother's dead now, um, but it would be very rare for me not to be in Dublin or in Bantry, like maybe once every two months. Okay. So it will happen that there's a stunning day in London and I do think that's the perfect day. I'd love to be in Glengarra yeah, Woods yeah, or yeah. walking the Abbey Road. But it's a pang and it passes. I mean, yeah. you know, we're 20 And how long years. have you been in London now? Oh my goodness, well over 20, maybe 30 years now. Yeah. So a long, long time. Now your first foray, I suppose, into television was on Casualty. Yes. Which I believe is, oh no, it's Holby City that is coming to an end. Yeah. I read this week. Yeah. Um, but Holby City is kind of a sister programme to it Casualty, is. isn't that yeah. right? Um, and did you start there? You had done, um, I read, you had done a, a screenwriting course. So did you go straight from the screenwriting course into Casualty or did you start as a researcher or how did you find your way into the writer's room there? Because of the, I had, I think I had two books published by then. Yes. And then, I, because I did theatre as well, like fringe shows and things like that. So I had another agent who dealt with theatre and TV. Um, I know. It, it, you, blessed. Yeah, blessed. But yeah, you know, you have to meet the right people at the right time as well. And I was very lucky. It's like speed dating, isn't it? It Getting is like, right agent. It is like yeah. speed dating. It really is. Um, and she said, there's a course, ITV are doing a course for screenwriting. Would you like to go along? And I said, would I ever? Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of playwrights on it. Uh, some people have gone on to, you know, massive big names. Um, Martin McDonough, I think, was one of them. Oh, really? I have a feeling. I could be wrong. I might be mixing him up. With it. But anyway, there was a lot. Um, Sebastian Coe was another. People who were doing theatre or novels kind of like myself, who didn't know whether they wanted to dip their toe in the water or not. It was the best course. It was and amazing. And where was it based? That was based in London. I couldn't tell you how long ago okay. now that was. But they brought in loads of very established screenwriters. And they brought in soap people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Lucy, people like Lucy Gannon, Linda LaPlante. Um, and it was wow. an eye-opener. And the guys that were talking about, because essentially a lot of the soap people were looking to poach people for work because it's you know it's such a machine it's such yeah. a machine yeah. and they constantly need to feed it with writers yes and it burns writers out and script editors i did 11 years in the soap opera I can, I, yeah I know exactly. and i should have left after two i know you know yeah it's just it's it's a terrible grind and a lot of the writers were very wary that mm. they were going to be trying 
people would try and talk them into that. But then uh, one of the guys that s started, oh, I can't remember his name, he started the one set in Liverpool, Brookside. Oh, right. And okay. he came on and, you know, he was saying that... Uh, it's like Phil Redmond. That's it, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Th that's him. Very nice man. And he was explaining that, um, you know, that people could be a bit snotty about soaps and stuff like that. But he said, you get a really good episode of a soap and you've got something you want to say. And the characters, you know, it does, it happens in all of them. Mm -hmm. They get hit the right episode with the right actor at the right time. He said, how many books are you going to sell? Really, in, in all realism. But with this one episode, you can reach, you can get your message across or you can get whatever you want to say to millions and millions of people. And I'd never thought of it that way. Yeah, I course. still didn't do soaps because yeah. I just didn't want to get, I was terrified of getting in the grind of it. Yeah, exactly. It, it is grueling because yeah. it's the equivalent. I, I mean, <clears throat> the one I worked on was four episodes a week. That's enormous. And that's the equivalent of making a feature film. It is. In a week. Yeah. You know, with all of the drafts yeah. of the scripts that that has yeah. to go through and all of the oversight and all of the layers of editorial. And yeah, it's it's very grueling yeah. work. Um, it's a juggernaut really, yeah. isn't it? I mean, series work is difficult enough. Yeah. But I, I just... So what was casualty like? When I got, got fired from it. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> I'm serious. How long were we there? <laughs> um, I think I was only there a few months. Uh, it's like that. It yeah, was, it is. It was like, the grind it is like of it. It's like that in Soapland, the turnover is... It's just, it was unbelievable. And I just, I, I couldn't get it. And I was doing everything that I could, yeah. you know, to give them what they wanted. It wasn't as if I was being difficult or anything. But I just, I could not get what it was. And you're pretty much thrown in. It's not as if they give you, like they give you one visit to a hospital. And you don't even get to see the set, so you don't know where anything is, and you don't know, yeah, yeah. and you really are writing blind. Um, and they but gave is me it up to you to know they, what the sets are? I would have thought that would be the director's job, I think that you they just should, write the yeah, dialogue. Yeah, they should. Is that not the case? It would help if they gave you, you know, just even like a sheet of paper just telling you, yeah. so that you know which corridors people are going to walk in or what. Okay. what locations you have available to you. Oh, you didn't even get that? No, it was weird. That's very odd. It was very odd. That's very the odd. one night spent in the hospital, um, and nobody wants you there. So I was in triage, yeah. uh, talking to the patients, really. Uh, and then I did, I must have done about five drafts. Uh, and then I got the phone call saying, I'm really sorry, Kate, but you know, Getting, That's very we're getting somebody somebody in to, to you know rewrite you and I'm thinking of five drafts and that I, anyway it was but anyway you proved them wrong I hope because so because <laughs> you had like you had a second bestseller the boy in the moon uh, you wrote the return for Julie Walters the kindness of strangers yeah. starring Neil Pearson and Hermione Norris like big UK stars and of course Mr Selfridge I know so. Like your work has been seen by millions all over the world I now. Know, I think I, know. I read that um, that uh, was it Mr. Salford who sold to 99 different territories. 220. All over the 220. 220. 220, yeah. That's, that's it, an extraordinary uh, reach for yeah. any writer. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. you know, I bet casualty are licking their wounds, dressing I, their wounds. I doubt if they remember me, Liz, to be honest with you. They went through execs as fast as they went through writers. I suppose, so, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I imagine you're in huge demand as a go-to writer now with such a good track record. Yeah. Do you ever think, I'm only marvellous, or are you constantly worried about the next project and the next project? I am constantly worried about the next project. Do you I'd never sit back and go, never. God, I'm amazing? No, no. no. And I, I'd be very surprised. I'd be very no, surprised. I think you're amazing. Oh, thank you, Liz. My mother does as well. That's great. <laughs> Two of us. Yeah. Maybe my sister, I think so. And uh, the millions of viewers. <laughs> no, I, I never do. Um, because I've been a writer for such a long time. Yeah. And I've known the fallow periods as well. Yeah, of course. And it happens to everybody. Mm. It happens to Jimmy McGovern. The phone stops ringing and you think, how could that happen? I've got a body of work. I've got the experience. 
but sometimes you fall between stools. Now, if you've got your own show, people don't ring you up to do an episode of theirs. They think, yeah. well, she'll, she'll only do her own shows now. I think so. that's what terrifies me about, you know, going back into television. Yeah. Like, I went from television to being a novelist. Yeah. And now I'm sort of I'm being invited back into television to adapt some of my own work. Yeah. And I'm yeah. really terrified. Yeah. So maybe you could tell me a little bit about um, the, the, the going from working on your own as a novelist, yeah. where it's just you and your editor to a certain extent, but your editor doesn't fix the problems in your work. No. You know, she just sends you back a list of all the problems and That's you do it. the fixing. So you yeah. do all of the rewrites. Yeah. So the work is really solely your own. Yeah. Whereas in the TV world, it's such a massive collaboration. It I mean, is. we think we talked about this on the yeah. phone the other day, yeah. that a lighting director can actually ruin your show. If you have a, you know, if something is really badly lit and everybody's in shadow, that can ruin your show because people aren't going to watch it. Or if the sound design isn't mm. great and the dialogue can't pick up. I can't recall how often recently I've been watching television and I've had to rewind a scene to say, what, what do they say? Yeah. Particularly intense TV dramas yeah. where you're, where, you know, every word is important. It's like, what did I miss? Yeah. Because it might have been the yeah. name of the murder yeah. or, or know. something, I you know. know. Yeah. And, you know, so it, it's such a huge collaboration. There are so many levels of editorial with script editors, producers, directors, Everybody has a little costume designers might say, oh, no, she wouldn't wear that or whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah. So how do you find that? Uh, it, I mean, it is. There is no comparison. Sometimes I haven't written a book for a while. I think yeah. a, four years now, five years. Right. But uh, and I will write a book again. I know I will. Um, but it is that that solitary mm -hmm. focus that you yeah. have to have. You have to be absolutely sure that it'll be more painful not to write this book than it will be to write it. I have to get to that point anyway. Mm. Um, and then you write your first line. And, and of course, you do, get, you do get sort of selfish about it once you've written screenplays, because you realise the first page, and you've got 350 odd pages to go. And I don't know about you, but the most pages I ever was able to write in a book and that was an extreme day, it was 15. I, that was just an extraordinary day. Yeah, I, I, I do a, a sort of a word count, and my average is probably like a thousand words a day. Which would be about three pages? Yeah, three or four yeah. pages, yeah. And I think that would have been about average for me as well. Yeah. So three pages, allowing for one day off a week, all of that, I yeah, know. It takes such a long time. But it does take yeah. such a long time. And you're not writing every day because and you're one not writing day you every day. Take your mother to the doctor, or you have a absolutely yourself or whatever. Exactly. So there are, there's and so that that to getting those three pages to add up, and then most of the day or a lot of the day will be reading what you did the day before and correcting that. That's how crying, I get in and, and crying, crying and, and a lot of crying tea. and yeah and you know, if it was a typewriter pulling out the thing and saying <laughs> this is shit but anyway um, yeah so there's a lot of that and displacement as well putting on another wash all of yeah. those things cleaning the toilets yeah oh procrastination and, is king yes. absolutely so there all of that goes with the book so I would have to know in my head I would be doing all of that and do you know how badly do I want to get to you know to write those th the line the end um, and then after all of that you send it to your editor and they come back with you know millions of suggestions so you're only you've only started the work really yeah so that is the thing the the lonely arduous journey of the book having said that the lovely thing about it is it's just you in a room and you could, something could happen yesterday or somebody's told you a story or whatever, and you can put it into the book. You've got the room, you can meander, uh, you can write a paragraph and you think, I really am proud of that. I love it. And that feeling gives you such a high. I don't think you get the same high from scripts, really. Okay. So the thing with the script is there's a lot of pages by the end of the day. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm talking really and very simplistic terms now. Yeah. But there is a great sense of satisfaction. If you're writing uh, an episode of something that has parts, you could have a part written in a day 
and then the next few days are all just about polishing and honing that. And then it goes out to, uh, as you say, like a myriad of people and everybody gets their say. Um, and it can get silly once the actors want, start wanting their say as well. Sometimes yeah. what they have to say can be very salient. But if you give the say to everybody, which we did in the end in Mr. Selfridge, it became unbearable because you would get a set of notes from as much as 20 people, 25 people, all saying different things, all thinking about their, their point of their own character yeah. and their yeah. point of view. Yeah. Um, and really it was allowed to get out of hand. Uh, and then after that, you've got the director's notes. You get to the point where you think, if I ever have to read this script again, or sit in a room and listen to it again, I really will be physically ill. Yeah. There's the director, the producer, and then after all of that, it goes to the network and they give you a whole other new set of notes. So that's the, that's the pain of the script, as opposed to the lovely solitude of the novel. So why do you do it? Oh, God. Um, I... I don't know what else to do, Liz, to be honest with you, is <laughs> the simple answer. I suppose it pays better and it's, it's It does more... pay well, and, you know, after but a certain stage. But do you like stage, the camaraderie of, of working with other people? I love that. Yeah. I mean, it does get painful at the end when you... Because novel yeah. writing can be very lonely it, sometimes. It can be very yeah. lonely. And I do love the camaraderie. Like I say, you get to a point where you get so sick of a script because by the time it's about to be made, it will have had maybe... It will have had four serious drafts. I mean, turning it inside out and upside down. And, and then it will have had about another five minor drafts. So you're with it the whole time. Uh, and that bit isn't great. The lovely bit is everybody in a room when we could get in a room. Yeah. And it's a long table and there's a whiteboard and there's nothing on it. And, just, and, and you don't know. Like at the moment, when I go back, we'll be looking at series three of Smother. Oh, fantastic. And it's just a blank page. We have no idea. And so one person in the room will say, you know, anything, something completely mad. Right. And then everybody says, oh, actually, there might be something in that. And the next thing, the whole day goes on and you look up at the whiteboard and it's just completely full. And that is just... That's a joy. That's a joy. Yeah. So let's go on and talk about Smother. Uh, we, what, 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 what's the process? Like, do you send out pitches for dramas to different production companies or do they approach you and say, Kate, we'd like you to come up with the story idea or do they have a rough idea of the kind of story they want and ask you to write that kind of story? Or How does yeah. it work? Uh, both ways, like that. Okay. Sometimes uh, it, it depends on the production company. Uh, of which there are 240 or something in London alone mm. now, which is crazy. And very often, once you get to know them, you'll find they specialise in different things. Yeah. Like some will do police procedurals, some, like Mammoth, will do the giant Agatha Christie oh, showcase yeah. things. Um, so after a while, you get to know all of those. And then your agent sends you out on spec meetings. So you just do a meet and greet. And they tell you what they're looking for, and you tell them, you know, what you have in your bottom drawer. Um, and sometimes something will click. Somebody will say, actually, I just saw Channel 5 last week, or I saw Sky, and they're looking for something like that. Right. It's as haphazard yes. uh, as, and stuff as that. Yes. And stuff becomes fashionable, and, totally. and stuff becomes unfashionable. Yeah. I remember pitching um, a drama set on a university campus uh, to to um, various networks yeah. and being told nobody wants to see middle class drama, yeah. nobody wants yeah. to see university. But I was kind of going, no, like if you actually read the yeah. pitch, because some of them are the canteen staff, some of them are the lecturers, yeah. some of them are the security guards. You know, it's not all about the middle class. I know. But I know. they said, no, 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 yeah. absolutely not. Yeah. No, yeah. we're not doing anything. And university. then normal people And it was because along. shameless was the thing yeah. at the time. Yeah. And they wanted working class dramas and yeah. they wanted really gritty and yeah. sink estates and all of that. Yeah. So and it does. It, I it goes like the that. First fence, you know, with that. Yeah. That well, as I said, normal people came along. Yes. Then. Yeah. I mean, you know, that <laughs> that is just the way it goes. I know. And then suddenly everything will be in a university. It's just amazing. And they'll do that as well. Like after Mr. Selfridge, 
there was a period of no period. We don't want any period. Yeah. It's too expensive. It is very expensive. It is not incredibly times. expensive. Yeah. It really is. I mean, you can um, treble your production costs. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll say only contemporary. And they'll all say to you, no more police pr procedurals, no more medicals. And then they will, you know, a couple of years later, a couple be, of, we're looking for not medicals even. and police procedures yeah. only. <laughs> yeah, they won't ever admit to it, but that's all they'll make. I've heard that in America now, they are not renewing and not looking for any police procedurals at all because of the Black Lives Matter issue. Oh. Because police now have a kind of a bad name, so they don't want to yeah. represent police on television anymore. Right. But that'll pass. That'll in pass. five years' time, they'll be back. Yeah. Because right. people love them. Yeah. I mean, they just, they love the solitary detective. Mm. Um, it's just a genre that just won't go away. That's and true. they love the p police thing. And, you know, mostly they like corrupt police. Yes. Bent coppers, as you mentioned. They're my favourite, like Mayor of Easttown. Yeah, oh, Mayor of Easttown was fantastic. <laughs> Planting the drugs on the... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Loved that. So sorry that's finished. I know, that but was yes, great. But yes, things go in, um, they do go in in cycles and in fashions as well yeah um and you just sometimes it is just you've met the right person at the right time so you did meet the right people with treasure entertainment who produced smother yeah. and they pulled out all the stops a superb cast yeah. absolutely flawless cast it's amazing amazing yeah. locations yeah. in west yeah. clare yeah. was it hard to get that across li the line to the broadcaster then no it wasn't i mean Probably the first port of call is was the BBC yeah. studios. Uh, Michael Park was the exec there, and he's a Dublin guy. And right. Michael and I had known each other from years. He used to work for Ecos. Um, and Smother was a different beast once upon a time. It didn't have a thriller. So we discussed about what if we added a thriller aspect to it. I had no idea at the time that that would capture people's imagination. I thought it was more the mother-daughter thing that people would be into, but it was okay. like, it was like, you know, who killed Dennis? So that was a great learning curve. So now we have to keep that going. Um, and then uh, Michael went to RTE who were looking, because RTE have very limited funds, as you know. Yes. And funding an entire series is very difficult for them. But the way it's all done now, it's all changed since co I... Co-productions. It's all co-productions mm. now. So a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there. You might get some, some from Sweden. And it's fantastic. So, so much more stuff is being made. I think RTE have like six, seven series, major series coming out next year. Fantastic. Done on the same basis. Yes. Um, and that ups the quality as well because there's more money coming in. Yes. And Screen Ireland will back it. Um, so he went to RTE and, and they were looking for kind of a middle class drama because they hadn't done one for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was fine. Uh, Michael knew Treasure, Rob and Rebecca Treasure, um, who are kind of like an institution production company in Ireland yeah. and very trusted and very able. <coughs> and then next thing we knew, they had this amazing cast. Yeah, weren't you lucky with those? And Very did lucky. did uh, did um, were you delighted to finally have something to make something that was set in Ireland? Yes. Was that very? Yes. It was. Was that a big deal for you? It was a huge big deal for me. It really was. It was also very nerve wracking, because you just think, you know, like we were saying earlier, up to a point I have control. Uh, I didn't write all the scripts, yeah. but I did have a say in who we heard and I read all their stuff. Yeah. Um, all that work goes on in the background as well. See, you know, would they have the same, a similar voice um, and would they get the characters and stuff like that? Um, and we were mostly incredibly lucky. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's like at some point you hand it over and you've no idea, you know, it's a young director as well. I think he did an amazing job. Really? Excellent. He'd only done one thing that I'd seen, which I thought was fantastic, but he didn't have like a huge... What was the other thing? It was, uh, and it was a kind of a documentary. I think it was, it was called Evelyn. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did see that. Yeah. yeah. But he didn't actually have any track record in drama. So, you know, that was a huge chance Rob and Rebecca took, but they'd looked at all his body of work. Um, and it's very impressive. It's very and impressive. And the whole look of Smother, the whole... 
feel yeah. of it, the atmosphere. And of course, like in the middle of it, you, you, well, first of all, you featured a very modern Irish family, not mm. unlike my own. Yeah. I have nine siblings. Yeah. Three of them have a different mother. Yeah. When my father split up with their mother, um, her new boyfriend was the same age as my older brother. It was very yeah. complicated. It was kind yeah. of like the kind of yeah. dynamic in, in some other without the murder, obviously. But um, yet. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so far, nobody's killed each other. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's a very, uh, you, you don't expect to see that kind of family, yeah. especially in West Clare. Yeah. And, but of course, they're everywhere. But they're everywhere. They're everywhere. I know. I, mean, I know. It's but like, the, you know, the extended family. Yeah. Or the fragmented family or whatever. Yeah. I mean, of course it exists in Ireland. Yes. And I think we sort of still got our head in the sands. Of uh, mum, dad and two children. Exactly. Yeah. The nuclear yeah. family. But the nuclear family, you know, exploded. It rarely exists. And there's yeah. all sorts of permutations of it now. And some of it works really well. You know, it, it, it's been in the UK for years, but now it's in Ireland yeah. and it's perfectly normal. Yeah. And we did, we were very um, aware that that was not represented uh, on TV and also very aware that a lot of the perceptions in, in the States and Australia and people who hadn't been to Ireland for years. They that, don't expect that. They, uh, they don't expect no. that and they do people who've never been to Ireland or, the, you know, they're third generation, but they have this romantic idea of it. They do think of the whitewashed cottage. Exactly. And the thatched roof. They genuinely do. Um, and so, so to represent a modern Ireland was... Uh, that was hugely important. Kind of groundbreaking, I, particularly now when it goes out into the world. I'm yeah. dying to see what the reaction is. I'm dying to see what um, the reaction is. Further afield. Yeah. I mean, it's sold so many places. It would be really interesting yeah. to see how where, it does. Where is it, where is it sold to? It's sold in America um, to NBC. So they're going to do it as a Peacock production, but as their own production. OK. And then it's sold to ABC do Australia. Do you mean they're going to remake it? No, they're not going to remake okay. it. They, but they will sell it as if it's uh, marketed, as okay. if it's their as own it's production. production. Yeah. OK, so they bought it. Yeah. Right. yeah, so they've bought uh, the both series. Um, and then uh, ABC Australia, which is RT or BBC. Fantastic. Yeah. So Sweden, Spain, France, I think. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. An international yeah. reach again. Yeah. I imagine that you didn't have much say in the casting and location and everything. When you found out who and where, did that, did that change anything about your approach to it, about how you were writing it? Um, no, because all of that was done after the scripts were written, really. Oh. I mean, they were looking, but my, my side of the scripts had already been done because I did episodes one and two. Uh, in my head, I had thought that it was Galway. A lot of these things aren't arbitrary. There are, they, they're based on where is there a film crew. Yeah. Um, and in Ireland, there's a film crew uh, full-time in Galway. I'm not sure if there's one in Cork. There may be. Um, and in Dublin, obviously. Right. Um, so... It had to be somewhere near Galway. They did, I don't know how many reckeys to Galway, but we needed a cliff. And if you want a cliff, where are you going to go? Clare. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah. County Clare is your yeah, man. Yeah. yeah and course. then uh, I hadn't seen that side of Clare. I mean, when I'd passed through Clare before, it was to the Burren, um, Father Ted's house. Yeah. You know, I've Lehinch. been to Kilkee many times. Kilkee. And that, yeah. Like the cliffs there are just. Yeah, I mean, I I, yeah. I I think I prefer them to the cliffs of Ower yeah. in some way yeah. because they're more accessible for a start. Yeah, know. exactly. But the beaches, I had not seen yeah. that side of Clare. It really is beautiful. It is. It's absolutely it is beautiful. stunning. Yeah. So I think the who and the why done it were the most compelling aspects of Smother. Did you know when you started writing who had killed Dennis? Uh, yes. You did. Yes. You knew from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Because I never know when I'm writing my books. I, I, I Do just you start, not? I never know until I get to the end <laughs> like, who did it or, you know, what the reason was or anything like that. Oh, God, I, that, I think that would keep me up at night. Well, it does. 
He was a particularly unpleasant character. And I can't tell you how many theories I had about who did it. And of course, I was completely wrong in all of them. And the list of suspects grew yeah. with each episode. Yes. So did you, did you selectively pick each character and then give them each a reason yes. to want Dennis dead? Yeah. Is that how you yeah. constructed it in your head? Yeah. So, and then you would start with, for the first two episodes, we were leaning towards Grace, but while, you, while the audience is fixed on that, you're, you're circling in yeah. another little story, and then you'll pick that up in three, and then that'll be Jenny's episode. And yeah. then you're circling another little story in that, and then it'll move to the, the next person. So that all the time, you're kind of with the audience, but slightly ahead of them. So they're thinking, oh, but that person in the background there, but it's not by chance. I was convinced it was Carrie Crowley. Everybody was. Who was Val's sister. I That's can't right. The character's name. I have yeah. the family Maureen. tree here. She's Maureen. Maureen, yeah. yeah. I don't know why, but loads of people thought yeah. that because she because didn't. Because she was the quiet yeah. one. And I always thought it's the quiet yeah. one you have to watch. Yeah. <laughs> and she hated Dennis as well. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So yeah, I was I was completely convinced. I had a, you know, but it was one of those things where, you know, it was like it was like um, the Eurovision that you'd have a scorecard and you'd have means motivation. I know. And whatever the other one is, means motivation yeah. and method, maybe method. Yeah, whichever. But you'd have a scorecard yeah. and you'd score each one I to try know. and figure out who did it. Well, and I know Marie didn't. We didn't really know, like, what her motivation yeah. would be or whatever. But I was convinced it was her. But a lot of things happened that um, influenced things, well, like lockdown. Yeah, because of lockdown, mm. and uh, like Marie had a bigger part. Um, but the actress was very, very concerned, and I think she had health issues. So really, you had to just let her kind of recede into the background yeah. um, for various reasons like that. Of course. Um, Lockdown happened just after filming had begun. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. But I, I, I kind of wondered in the end, having watched it, um, it might have been for the best because I know there was, there was so like it was just obviously cold when they were filming because it was in the middle of winter. Yeah. But there were so many exterior scenes that probably should have been yeah. indoors. Yeah. But I think they were all the better for it. Yeah. I think it made it a more real yeah. and a more uh, racinated yeah. series, if yeah. you like, because yeah. of that. Well, I mean, every chance they got, they did something outside. There were times when I was looking. And Derv Lecaron's hair was like flying. And I'm thinking, <laughs> why is she having that conversation in a vegetable patch? It doesn't make any sense. She could have this indoors. I but didn't I, notice that. Like, it didn't bother I didn't, me. I but I realised it was because it wasn't raining that day. Yeah. And they thought, we're darned if we're going to have another scene inside to try and avoid being too soapy or whatever. I don't know. And did you have to do any rewriting around that? No. Once it's, that's the beauty of it. There so is a you point, hand it over. you hand it over and, and it's then. totally the director's baby then. Okay. And I give him carte blanche because there's no point in being precious. There's yeah. no point in saying, I really want to keep that line or whatever, because there's still somebody else who's yeah. going to tinker with it once the director has done his stuff. And that's the editor in the room. Because I love the fact that they never commented on the weather, because if you live in the lounge yeah. in the wilds of yeah. winter, you're like you expect that kind of weather. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, you wouldn't necessarily I was there in February out. before yeah. they started, and I literally was nearly lifted yeah. off the, the, wind, the promenade. The wind is unreal. Yeah. Unreal. So they have to be super fast. The minute it stops raining, and the minute there's any light, they're out there so fast. They set it up so fast. It's it's. So how much time did you actually spend on the set? When, when filming started? None. None? You weren't None. there at all? Couldn't, because of COVID. And uh, they're nearly finished filming season two, which will be finished at the end of June. And I've not been on set once. So it's, that's, that's kind of hard. Cause Would normally, you prefer to be? Well, yeah. You, it, it's part of the, the fun of it. Yeah. 
is actually seeing your work being yeah, realized. Yeah, and seeing what take the director's going to take. Now, oh, in that scene, oh, I wrote it there, but he's actually doing it there. And I'm sure you'd yeah. like to be in the background having a cup of coffee somewhere. You'd you? love to be. Would you? Yeah, yeah. I would. I yeah. would. Of course yeah. I would. I'd be lying otherwise. I wouldn't want yeah. to be there all the time. No. But, you know, it, it is your baby and they're working so hard. And you'd like to say thank you. Yeah. Simple thing. You I'd know. like to have seen you in the funeral scene. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was in the funeral scene. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to, you know, put my mother in or something. You know, all of that's those joyful things that I had in Mr. Selfridge. I haven't had the chance to have. And did the weather affect the filming, as far as you know? I, uh, I think they just simply worked around it. Yeah. I mean, you'll notice as well. There's quite a lot of scenes in cars that yes. were actually meant to be outside and driving and driving. Yeah, yeah. quite a lot. Because yeah. I mean, you know, they were filming in. Uh, at the moment, when they started this time, because they started later, uh, they've had stunning weather and then it all went yeah. pear-shaped. But um, yeah, so we'll have a very, very fast turnaround if um, touch wood. We well, get to, it was such a huge three. accomplishment and hats off to you and oh. the entire team behind it. Um, when you finally saw it, were you delighted or did you think there were there's, was there something I could have changed or I could have done that better? You know, or is there, all, is there always yeah. things where you think, oh, God, I could have yeah. done this or I could have done that? Yeah, I mean, everything, as you know, Liz, Same everything books, is, yeah. is a learning curve. Yeah. Everything, it doesn't matter how many things you've done yeah. and what age you are. Um, I looked at the first episode and I thought, that's confusing. And I think a lot of people were saying the same thing on Twitter. And we actually reshot it because it was quite confusing. Uh, you, you're introduced to the first episode of anything is it's really difficult. I know because you have to establish all the characters and the relationships. You have to establish new characters people have never met before. Who are they related to? You've got to get your story driving. I mean, yeah, uh, it, it, it it was it was easier with season two because you've got your established characters, but it's so still you don't have to yeah. Go so I kind of learned from that. Having a party is a great way of introducing all your characters, but it's also an awful lot for an audience to assimilate. Mm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that again. Sure. It settled down after that, but yeah, that, that was part of the curve. So um, what has been your favourite series to watch in recent times? Like, what have you loved? What series do you wish you had written? Like, I sensed a very Scandi influence in Smother. Am I right? Do you watch well, all I the love, Scandi dramas? Yeah. I yeah. love all the Scandi dramas, um, uh, to the point where I've got saturated with them. Yeah. But I do that with everything. I'm obsessed yeah. with some one type of book and one type of... Uh, like at the moment, I'm really into true crime. Um, I would have given anything to have written Mayor of Easton. Yeah, it's absolutely I think super. anybody would have, yeah. yeah. And then again, you know, you look at it and you think without her performance, I wonder... Because I wonder would it have yeah, been... Because there were, when you look back and you think, actually, there was quite a few plot flaws. There was, yeah. 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 And quite a few... Unresolved. Unresolved things and things. Yeah. If, you, if you really picked into it, yeah. you could say, well, you didn't... I think as writers, yeah. we're always looking for those. Do you know what I mean? Totally. You know. You're looking at the analysis yeah. of it and everything. Yeah. But because her performance and her friend Laurie yeah. were so... And the mother. God, she was fantastic. The mother was brilliant. The mother was brilliant. She was such a great character. She was a brilliant <laughs> character. And so that carries you through. So, you'll, so I wonder if, as a piece of writing, it was actually that brilliant. I wonder how much of it was Kate Winslet's yeah, yeah. performance. I wonder. I think, I, I think the writing was pretty good. It was pretty yeah. good, yeah. I don't, I don't, I, but as you say, yeah. without Kate... Yeah. I yeah. just call her Kate as if she's my best mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you ever pull out of a show? Did you ever walk off a show? And for what reason? Did that ever happen? Uh, I know loads of people that have done that. I've never done it. You've never done no, it? No, I haven't. And in an industry infamous for its misogyny, have yeah. you ever come up against that? <gasps> All the time. All the time. It's getting a lot better. But, you know... Is it getting better? Do it you is honestly feel it's getting better? I honestly do feel everywhere. it's getting better everywhere. I really do. Um, I mean, you know, 
I can't begin to tell you how many meetings when I was much younger and greener and very anxious to please yeah. um, and just happy to have the job. But, it, you know, mostly the bosses would be male, although in drama there's quite a lot of females. Finally. It, yeah, finally. Um, although fe female bosses can be as misogynistic they can as, be. as, you know, yeah. I, I, in my experience I have found that, you know, female bosses can be just as misogynistic yeah, as men. Yeah, they can be. Um, kind of to prove themselves sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've come across that. But yes, definitely. Um, it's, uh, it's, well, it can still happen, you know, that we're, we're all in a meeting and I still find around the table that uh, if a woman talks, uh, she'll always give way. If a man suddenly thinks of something and he's, he just starts to say it over her, it will always be the woman who will give way. Yeah. 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 And I try to stop myself doing that. But it's kind of in your blood and it's very, very hard I know. to we're, not we do that. We were kind of bred that way, weren't we? We were. You to know, give way. You, just a man, automatically, his voice is stronger, deeper. It resonates in the room more. It makes you, the fact that he's talking over you makes you second guess what you were saying anyway, because it can't have been that important because somebody's going to speak over me. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, oh God, it is getting better, but nah, there's ways to go. So we can't wait to see the second series. I mean, um, and it's finishing at the end of this month, finishing filming at the end of yes. this month. Yeah. Can you give us any clues or even a little hook? Are we going to find out, like, I want to know who Anna's mother is. And I want to know, I have to look at my family tree now. I know, that's, yeah, that's yeah, tough. Anna's mother, Anna's mother is Val. Anna's mother is Val. Anna's mother's Val. Anna, Val is mother to Jenny, Anna and... Grace. Grace, yeah. Uh, and oh, okay. Yeah, but she had Jenny with another man. That's right. Yes, which is Sean why Dennis in didn't London. leave her anything. Exactly. Yes. That's okay. right. So she had Anna and Grace with Dennis. But we want to move into, so we've got the same characters, but we wanted to move into another story. We will carry on that story, the resonance okay. of how it affects the family and is everything. Is Rory going to be back? Um, Rory, is, he will be back, but not as you know him. <laughs> okay. I can I can see where you're going with that. Yeah, yeah. Flashbacks, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering if the if Jenny's if the father of Jenny's baby is ever going to find out that he's the father of Jenny's baby. That's that's another mystery that's to be solved. A big one. Yeah. Yes. That will feature quite a lot. That is Jenny's story. Great. Uh, for episode two, and there will be a brand new character uh, who will just pitch up and set set the cat amongst the pigeons really fantastic yeah fantastic so i don't think yeah we i think we do have a good shocking opener which i love and you do in your book so well i, I think once you're hooked that yeah. i think that's just and do a you have joy. a broadcast date for it do we know when it's going to i be would imagine that that will be the same as before because the the networks like to do it that way well i hope you're not up against line of duty again i know that was that, that was, was really unfortunate timing, that was unfortunate it? but it, we didn't drop any figures that was no, a great didn't. thing you didn't everybody in ireland watch it yeah because everybody in ireland wants to see homegrown stuff you yeah know, we exactly see, we yeah. want to see our own and with catch up people knew that they could um catch could, up on either yeah, anyway yeah exactly. so we didn't drop anything so i was blessed with that um, but I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine it went March, wasn't it? I think it was March, February, March. It, it was in the depths of the despair, yeah. is all I can tell you, because it was my highlight of the week. Oh, every that's week so nice to, to hear. actually have my Sunday evening with Smother and yeah. a cup of tea. And um, yeah, it, it gave me a lift yeah. through the worst oh, of the last That's lockdown. lovely to hear. I so think the landscape and the, the you know, the, everything that just sort of made people feel a little bit, can't wait to go there. That was a lot of the remarks, just dying to get to County yes, Clare. absolutely. Everybody wanted to yeah. go west. Well, it's been lovely talking to you. I wish you 
every success with Thank the you, Liz. future and with I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Another series of Smother after this, a third series? Probably, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Has that been greenlit yet? Well, they won't green light until the very last minute, but they, they will be commissioning scripts, which means Fantastic. it's as good as really. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't invest in those characters without wanting to know more yeah. and more. And push them, and bring them to the, the limit, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's thank been you, Liz. To talk to you. It's been thank a you. pleasure. And thank you to thank West you. Cork Literary Festival. Um, you, I don't know when this is going to be broadcast, but uh, who knows? Thank you so much for joining us today.